Cowboy head is off. So we're going to talk to you guys first off. I'm going to start off talking about steroids in shock. Whoa, that's not water. <laughs> so you're in the emergency department. You have a patient who EMS has brought in from a nursing home who's excited. Right? Nobody is. <laughs> and they brought in for a chief complaint of altered mental status. Exactly. <laughs> So they're concerned about sepsis. This is your initial set of vital signs. They're febrile, they're tachycardic, hypotensive. And you're looking at the patient and you're looking at their foley and it looks like somebody put oatmeal into it. And you know for a fact that the probability is that they have a urinary tract infection is pretty high. So the next question is, do you do what you normally do, but add steroids to that? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's think about what times that we do use steroids and why. What is the application of using steroids? Is there any real physiologic evidence that shows steroids work in sepsis? Oftentimes, we tend to think of sepsis as this kind of bag where we throw fluids, vasopressors early as a result of the new study that just came out, antibiotics early. Certainly, we want to jump on these patients relatively quickly so that they don't have worsened outcomes. And then steroids is this kind of box where we're thinking about, should we do it? Should we not do it? Is this something that's going to be helpful to my patient? And in most circumstances, we don't really know. How did we get here? Well, let's talk about what steroids does do physiologically. So aside from causing muscular hypertrophy and testicular atrophy, <laughs> Steroids does a number of things to the immune system. Number one, we all know that <laughs> mineralocorticoids do increase blood volume and help with vascular tone, which certainly would be helpful in patients who are having increased permeability at the vascular level. Subsequently, on top of that, we know that corticosteroids help with the immune system. They help by decreasing the pro-inflammatory markers and cytokines, and they, de they increase the anti-inflammatory cytokines, which certainly can help in inflammation. And lastly, we've known that sepsis does decrease the activity of the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So there is a relative, or thought to be a relative adrenal insufficiency that does occur, especially in severe septic shock. So steroids, you would think, would certainly be helpful. So where did we get? What do we do with this patient who is sitting here in front of us, hypotensive, tachycardic, and looking critically ill? Well, let's look at the evidence as to why we have been using it. First came out the inane study. This came out in 2002. And this study looked at around 400 patients, and they looked at the addition of hydrocortisone and fluticortisone versus placebo. But those patients all had a, a corticotropin stem test done, and the ones who failed got steroids, and guess what? Increased mortality, increased outcomes. So what does everybody say? Steroids. We must give steroids and sepsis. Then the corticus study came out in 2008. New England Journal, the Bible of all journals, although we know better. And the corticus study found that if you jumped on patients relatively early with steroids, there was no improved benefit with steroids. So what did everybody say? No steroids. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And then someone said, well, the first study came out, 2002, looked at severe septic shock. Those patients were really sick in the inane study. And this study that came out with corticus, the patients weren't necessarily as sick yet. They were on their way, but they hadn't got there yet. So they said, maybe if we give steroids between that, maybe we can prevent them from going into severe septic shock. Enter the hyper study. So they gave them hydrocortisone before they went into severe septic shock. And what did they find? Not really a whole lot of benefit. There was no benefit to steroids to prevent patients from going into severe septic shock. So, enter 2018. Here comes the adrenal study. So the adrenal study was the one that we hoped for. Everybody looked at the cortica study and said, well, that was a poorly, poorly done study. It wasn't really done well. Let's do another one and see what happens. So the adrenal study came out in 2018. And what it did was it looked at 30, almost 3,500 patients. And they gave one group a hydrocortisone infusion of 200 milligrams a day. And they gave the other group placebo. 
And what were the results? Well, let's look at 90-day mortality. And they looked at some other ones, reversal of shock, time in the ICU, time in the ventilator, time of, on pressors. Subsequently, they found that 90-day mortality, no difference between the two groups. However, when you look at some of the patient-centered outcomes, the time on the ventilator, time in the ICU, length of stays in the ICU, there was a statistically significant difference, showing that steroids did increase the or increase, decrease the time to resolution of shock, decrease the length in the ICU, decrease the length on the ventilator. So, patient-centered outcomes versus mortality, there's a conundrum. What do we do? What are we basing our treatment off of? This study really just showed us that there was no real harm to giving steroids. There's just no difference in terms of mortality. There is a caveat to this. <laughs> The adrenal study actually said that you had to give a 200 milligram per day infusion as opposed to what we typically do with stress dose steroids where we're giving them 100 milligrams Q8 hours. So that is a little bit of a caveat. So someone said, well, maybe the adrenal study isn't the end all be all. Let's look at some other things. Enter the approaches study. The approaches study looked at hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone, and activated protein C versus placebo. And we all know what happened to activated protein C. It went the way of the dodo bird. So this study was also pretty well done, 1,200 and so patients. They got either activated protein C with hydrocortisone and fluticortisone, activated protein C by itself, placebo or steroids by itself. Now, problem number one, activated protein C went the way of the dodo bird, so they actually had to stop the trial for the first time. And then subsequently they stopped it again due to safety concerns. And it ended up being a two-year suspension in this study. But subsequently, it came out looking again at 90-day mortality. And they found there was a decrease in the patient's mortality who received hydrocortisone and fluticortisone. So of course, everybody's all up in arms now. Wait a minute, maybe this is something that we should be doing in our septic patients. And again, if you look at these patient-centered outcomes, ventilator, presser, free days, again, better outcomes with hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. But again, there are some caveats to this. One is the addition of fludrocortisone. There was no comparison between hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone head-to-head. -head. It was just hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone versus placebo. Second caveat is that fludrocortisone doses that they were using was 50 micrograms, which isn't a really high dose. It's actually a really low dose. So the question is, is the hydrocortisone the better steroid to be using in these patients? So where are we? Well, if you look at the overall thought process between, between both of these studies, you'll see that really there's no mortality benefit to giving steroids and sepsis. But when you look at patient-centered outcomes, maybe this is something that we should be thinking about. Do we want our patients to have faster reversal of shock? Of course. Do we want our patients to come off the ventilator faster? Of course. Do we want our patients to get off the vasopressors? Of course. Out of the ICU faster. So maybe this is something that we should be thinking about. So what do we do? Here we are at this stage in our careers looking at steroids and septic shock. What do we do? So here's what I do. I say... Certainly, if the patient has a risk of adrenal insufficiency due to being on chronic steroid therapy, it's a no-brainer. Done. Make it happen. If the patient is requiring multiple doses of, of pressors, in other words, you're not just hanging your norepi and you're leaving them alone and saying, I'm going to give them steroids. You're starting to max out your norepinephrine and you're starting to think, maybe I should add a second pressor. Maybe I should add a third pressor. In order to get them off the pressors faster and reverse that shock, I will give them a dose of stress dose steroids in that circumstance. And I'm using hydrocortisone and not fludrocortisone in that circumstance. And that's what I do in my practice. That is my talk on steroids. <laughs> and as a result of steroids, <laughs> we see that Salim has certainly bulked up in size. And as a result of him bulking up in size, Salim has been a role model to some people in my family, including my son. My son has seen Salim and looked at him and said, Dad, I can do that. And sure enough, I think he's done a daggone good job of trying to get to that point. And so I said, well, if Salim can do it, and my son, who's 12, can do it, 
then I should be able to do that too. So what did I start doing? I started lifting weights real hard, getting really into my diet, getting into lifting weights, running, and subsequently I lost 68 pounds. Woohoo! Right? Thank you. <laughs> and so as a result of that, seeing Salim, seeing my son, I said, you know what? At Rebellion, I'm going to take my shirt off. Yeah! yeah! I'm taking my shirt off, baby. I'm going to show y'all what I'm working with. I'm working with something, too. Yeah! Yeah! 